Hi, everyone. I am really excited because I have a headset on, and um, if we accomplish nothing else today, we have fulfilled my childhood desire of being Janet Jackson. Uh, so my name's not Baby, uh, it's Janet, Miss Jackson if you're nasty. So as he said, I am a vlogger turned chief social media marketer, chief marketing officer, and I love social media. I think that social media is the way that we will be connecting probably for the rest of our lives. Grand statement to make, but I'm a believer. I started social media over 10 years ago, back whenever you couldn't be on Facebook unless you had an actual university email address. And so my community college friends were really, really angry that I was able to be hanging out on Facebook, and they weren't. Uh, so what I want to talk to you today is about this is me and the social media paradigm. So if you are going to be tweeting, use this is me hashtag. So this is my daughter, Addison. She's so cute, and she's cuter than your kids. Uh, so, <laughs> right? So if there is one thing beyond the Janet Jackson thing that you need to learn about me, it's that I believe my child is cuter than your child. Uh, but what this picture displays, my friend Megan Clements, uh, she took this picture for me, and it was a painstaking process to get this picture. But it's a great example of authenticity, right? Because on social media, we have the opportunity to curate our stories. We are constantly defining and redefining our storyline. And we know that as a community, as social beings, we care about the value of story. Uh, so what, where does authenticity fit in there? Right? When I say social media, you probably think, to some degree, ah, eh, fake. It's fake storytelling. That person is talking about how happy they are. The other person is talking about how successful they are. And then two days later, you see that they're divorced, and you're wondering whatever happened. So somewhere along the way in social media and being an influencer online, we lose authenticity, right? So this picture is sort of authentic, but this is <laughs> real life, right? Yeah, I bribed her with cookies to get the other picture done, and I told her that I would paint her room pink and give her a tutu. This is real. <laughs> this is real Addison. This is who she is probably 90% of the time. She's high drama. She is the new Janet Jackson, I suppose. Um, and so when we're talking about authenticity, we are talking about this radical statement that you are going to assert your identity at all cost. And online, we're not doing that as much it's a frightening thought, right, that we are taking this power to curate our stories and we're cutting out the picture of the laundry in the Instagram photo and we're choosing the filter that covers up our acne and we're not embracing the gravitas of our story. And so the important thing about this is me and authenticity means that you say, I am secure enough with myself to admit that I ate at Chipotle before my TEDx talk and I have a food baby in a form-fitting dress. That's authenticity, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So what gets in the way of us engaging authentically and telling our story in a way that connects us with other people? Well, my degree is in psychology, and I spend a significant amount of time talking about behavioral neuroscience, and I love it. So I talk about the prefrontal cortex enough, and my six-year-old is like, yeah, mom, Pokemon, who cares about the amygdala? But what I want to talk to you today about, what I want to talk to you about today is the amygdala hijack. We all know this. We've heard this in other TED Talks about fight or flight. So when we're walking along a path, we see what we think is a snake, and our fight or flight reflex kicks in, our limbic system gets activated, and we decide to run because, oh my gosh, that's a snake. Or we decide to just laugh it off and decide that we're ridiculous because it's not a snake, it's a water hose. And so there is no threat. What I think stands in the way of online authenticity and sincerity is the amygdala hijack, right? So we look at what a person says online and we decide that they are threatening to us for whatever reason and we need to run. Or we say that they're benign and we walk past them and we don't connect. It becomes an issue because we can't trust what we don't know, right? So going back to the amygdala hijack example, Vastly different outcomes if you decide it's a snake versus if you decide it's a water hose. But both things, both actions require knowing. And that is so important whenever you're thinking about living a life that's congruent and authentic, right? You have to know, is it a water snake or is it, or excuse me, is it a water hose or is it a snake? 
And so if we don't trust what we don't know, there is a dual responsibility on the part of community and on us as individuals to define who we are. I can't represent myself authentically if I don't know who I am, right? So the conversation online, social media, and this powerful vehicle for human connection becomes a call for us to explore who we are. And that's frightening, because that requires vulnerability. And Brene Brown beautifully said, uh, you know, of course, I hope to be Brene Brown one day. I have a little bit of a fangirl crush on her. That vulnerability, that it is so much more worth embracing that vulnerability than spending a lifetime running from it. So whenever I talk about online influence, my sphere of influence, the probability is that the people that follow me on Instagram and Twitter and Vine and all of my vlogs and all of the other areas, that influences amounts to almost 3 million people in projected influence. That's a lot of people for me to have at my fingertips hearing what I have to say and connecting with me. So those who know me and know about my blog and follow me on Twitter and Instagram know that I engage in radical authenticity. I talk about my bad days. I talk about my marriage struggles. I talk about the fact that I have a Chipotle food baby and people are going to watch it on YouTube. Um, and that creates a kind of vulnerability that is necessary for connection. So as I was preparing for this talk, I really wanted to do what my speech and debate professor told me that uh, was the most invaluable thing to provide to people, and, um, which is an example of joining, right? That he said that if you could project an idea that people could join with, then you have created a powerful community. So when we are authentic and we also identify who we are as people, both for ourselves and for others, we create a paradigm where people are able to say, this is me, me too. So joining equals community and community equals power. We know that a cord of three or a, a strand of three is not easily broken, right? But when you're standing alone, it is. The great thing that you can do whenever you find yourself in community and identifying with a tribe of people, as Devin from Fayetteville Ch said, or Fay Chill said, um, that if you find your freaks, then you can have a community that automatically supports that developing identity that you have. But what it also does is gives people the opportunity to separate from you. This is really important because we're always talking about tribes, we're always talking about our peer groups and building community. But if we are not being authentic, we are dragging people along who may not, be on the, who may not want to be on the ride with us. And so, we have an opportunity to fully identify ourselves and create these communities. The power of joining is the power to transform ourselves, and I believe that social media is the vehicle in which we do that. So going back to what my professor said about making sure that I give a great um, three-point example to any of my talks, I wanted to really, really, excuse me, I wanted to really, really give you guys something that you could chart out. And a Venn diagram, apparently, is what this is called. I had no idea. I kept calling it concentric circles. <laughs> um, it's not. It's not a concentric circle. So what I believe is the vehicle behind transformation is congruence. And this is what I believe makes up congruence. Vulnerability, as Brene Brown said, is the courage to be who you are. Authenticity, the radical belief that um, you are going to, at all costs, be yourself. And sincerity. Sincerity is when you can interact with other people in the community and care about what they care about without losing the integrity of your identity. So those all together equal this beautiful, powerful ability to transform. Now... Currently, where we're at in society is we're working our brains in this fight or flight reflex. We are pinning these beautiful um, panda pancakes and organized meals for your kids that are color co coordinated and you've got your baby in his hipster glasses. I am not bitter about Pinterest. I'm just saying that whenever it came on the scene, I had a significant amount of shame resilience that I had to build up because I would get on Pinterest and I would look at Casey's images from lifeofruzel.com and I would think, I don't know how she takes a picture of her child's meal every day and how it is so nutritious and colorful and balanced and how she can pin that because I just sent my six-year-old off to first grade eating a partially eaten granola bar that I found on the minivan floor because we were so late that I forgot to feed him. 
right? Right? So part of my journey of knowing who I am and being okay with myself means to detach myself from that fight or flight reflex, that caveman thinking of, I have to run because I'm threatened by Life of Ruzel's amazing all vegan pins on Pinterest. Like I said, I'm not bitter. She's a good friend of mine. I'm just saying it would be helpful if she would show us some outtakes, right? Like the failed panda pancake that didn't work or the time she tried to take the picture and the blueberries rolled all the way off the plate. We like the outtakes and we like the blooper reel because it adds that gravitas to our story. So if all you're putting online, if the only thing that you're curating is this perfectly fashioned storyline where there's the, the humanity is sapped out of it, people are still engaging in that fight or flight reflex because they don't know you. So my contention is that you move to a place of authenticity, this, this internal fortress that you build for yourself that says, I can admit that I shouldn't have eaten Chipotle before I had to stand in front of people because it makes you gassy. <laughs> those, those kind of things, and you know, they're not always funny, right? Sometimes it's hard stuff to say, well, guys, I don't always feel so great about my body, or my six-year-old doesn't always get breakfast on time, or my love relationships are not going the direction that I think that they should go, right? I'm just talking about building a congruence online that is reflective of who we are truly. So I've thrown a lot of information and definitions your way, but the thing that I want to impart to you most is a story by Robert Fulgham. He's an essayist who has this great vernacular for really bringing out, like, oh, you just used that little tiny example, and now my mind is blown. So he wrote about this amazing experience that he had uh, playing sardines versus playing hide-and-seek. And And the the book that he wrote is Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. So he tells his story, and for those of us who aren't deists in the room or even Christian, um, let's just receive this story with an open heart because I think all truth uh, translates. So he says in his Christian worldview that he believes that God, the Christian God, is not a God who plays hide and seek. Thomas Aquinas talked about God being deus abscondus, and I am not a Latin scholar, so if I mispronounce it, I I apologize. But essentially, this God who hides from us. And so our fight or flight reflex connects to this idea because a lot of us are hiding from each other, not just in social media, but in life. And so Fulgham asserts that God is not the God who hides. He's actually the God who plays sardines right? Have you ever played sardines? It's exactly like the name suggests. Everyone packs in together, right? And eventually everyone's packed in together, giggling in this puppy pile, and that's how you play, as opposed to people like me who would play hide and seek and hide so well because I am such a rock star that people would give up, and two hours later I was hanging out in the closet by myself wondering where everybody went, Turns out they went and had a fruit by the foot and a juice pack, and I was just hiding by myself, right? (laughs) So once again, childhood wounds. I'm not bitter. I'm just saying if it was a Pinterest diagram, I could teach you in five easy steps how to be a hide-and-seek rock star. No. But going back to the point of Fulgham, he says that God is seeking us out. And so in the same sense, when we talk about classical literature or any narrative, the idea of origin stories, where we came from, and naming is so valuable, right? The first task that the God of the Old Testament in the Christian Bible gives is to name. And so we need to name ourselves and name others, and so this is so very important because it's, it's the bedrock of community, right? You can't be brave enough to jump, like Fayette Chill said, unless you know that like, you're okay to jump, that you're in your body, that you're present with yourself. The other thing he says, Robert Fulgham, in that essay, is that he knew a doctor, and the doctor had cancer, and the doctor was obviously informed that he didn't have very long to live. And so what he did was kept his secret to himself so his family didn't know that he was dying. When he finally died, his family did all the things that you do in a eulogy. You say the beautiful achievements, you talk about how powerful the person was, how well they were loved. But Robert says in his essay that secretly his family was really angry. And they were angry because they had an opportunity to join with him in his suffering, to truly know who he was through that process of transformation, and they had been denied that opportunity. 
I have a community that uses the hashtag, this is me. About 500 women who get together online. We've got a Facebook group and we encourage each other to be radically authentic, to go there, to get gritty whenever things aren't as easy and we want to pretend online. And so I want to invite all of you through this challenge to use the hashtag, this is me. If you're struggling, talk about it. If you're exuberant and you're loving life, talk about it. But be authentically yourself. Because I think that if we can be honest about where we're going to be in a couple of years, that we truly want to look at uh, our social media experience and have people say, I knew that person. Ask yourself now, if all a person knew about you was what they see on social media, is it congruent with who you really are? A lot of us may not be able to say yes. And so I think the mind shift comes whenever we're able to truly be ourselves in spite of the fight or flight reflex, right? So going back to that story about the doctor who kept a secret his cancer and didn't let his friends and family join him. If you don't have a responsibility to yourself to live authentic, to be vulnerable, to be sincere so that you can have that congruent life, you owe it to your loved ones because we want to join with you in, help, in helping to shape your story, right? So the last thing I want to leave you with is this picture of yoga. I went to hot yoga a couple of times, and then I decided that I like roller derby better um, because there's less hitting in hot yoga than what I prefer. <laughs> I need full, like, hip checks. So um, what I did learn in my brief stint of pretending like I could do yoga uh, was this. When I feel that guttural reaction of resistance and fear, it is an invitation to lean into the pain and ask, what is resisting? And if we're really honest, what resists for us is that fear, that fight or flight, that people won't love us if they know the truth, that our family of origin convinced us that ladies who wear red lipstick are fast, and so you can't wear red lipstick. Well, Grandma Annie Pearl, I'm wearing red lipstick and I am not fast right? So authenticity comes with the responsibility and the freedom and the power to shape our own narrative. And so in the yoga tradition, although I am a roller derby girl, I will invite you all to use this as me, to engage in radical authenticity and to lean into the resistance when you feel afraid to be yourself online. And from there comes the mind shift and true community. Thank you.